We're starting this new series called All In. We're going to focus on the wise men. We're going, to, we're going to look at what they did in their life and how we can ask ourselves the question, would we be one of the wise men? Would we be part of that? But before we get started, I want to just ask you this question. Have you ever been, uh, have you ever been so excited about something? Like it doesn't matter what it is in your life. Uh, you are so excited about something. You, you were, you were all in, you were fully committed. And, and when you got there, there didn't seem to be anybody else excited. Like how many of you guys have been to a Christmas party where you deck yourself out? Like you got the ugliest Christmas sweater on, you got the shoes, the boots, you got everything. You look like Jacqueline and Preston up here. with the rabbit ears or whatever those were, reindeer ears. But when you got there, everybody kind of looked at you like, are you crazy? I mean, are you, are you really serious? I, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of times when we do those kind of things, right? We, we're all into something. We're, we are so excited. Some of you guys have been so excited. You show up to a football game or a sports event and you're the crazy fan in there. And you're wondering, why isn't everybody crazy like me? And everybody else is just sitting there like, you are a nutcase. <laughs> Most of you would be either that person. How many would you say you're the crazy person? Raise your hand. Wow, we got such a dead church here, man. <laughs> so I am the opposite of that. So I'm with all you who did not raise your hands. Because there's two parts here, right? You're either the crazy person or you're the person who's like just literally the no fun party guy. That's me. In college, my wife and I would go to LU football games. She would be decked out. I would sit as far away from her as possible. <laughs> like I am not doing that. Well, I think it's interesting in our lives how we get, what we get excited about and how we're all into things and how we're just so, so passionate about them. And, and oftentimes we wonder what in the world is going on. And so I wanna take you back in time to a time when that happened. A time when someone was so excited, so all in, and when they showed up, they thought to themselves, what is going on? These are the three wise men. We can call them the three kings. And we re reality is we don't know that there was even three, just so you know. The Bible doesn't say how many there were. There were just three gifts, so we think three kings, but that's not true. Could have been eight, ten, seven, three. We'd have no idea. We also don't know whether, whether it was two years that they traveled, but we know that it was at least, uh, it wasn't right off the bat. It did take them some time to make this journey. And so when they're showing up here, we got to ask ourselves, what was happening in their minds? What was happening when they showed up? They had this incredible eager anticipation they were thinking about what was going on. Now, remember what has happened here in history. If you're, you're new to the story, uh, Christ obviously has been born. He is born of a virgin and he is born in Bethlehem. And there has been two other uh, public uh, events that have happened. At his birth, the shepherds were told and so the shepherds were told by the angels that Christ had been born. It was kind of a private, but yet at the same time, these shepherds were definitely full of joy and telling everybody about it. Then we have Jesus going to the temple and Simeon and Anna uh, declaring that this is the Messiah. And again, this is not totally public, but it was definitely where people would have been talking about it. And now we come up to this third announcement. This announcement by these complete strangers, these magi. If you have your Bible, let's open up and let's just read what happened here in this story. It's in Matthew chapter two and verse one. And we're just gonna read this really quickly and we're gonna talk a little bit about it. Here it goes, Matthew chapter two and verse one, it says this. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. That's the Persian area, the India area saying, where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it arose and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king had heard this, he was troubled in all of Jerusalem with them. And they assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people. And he inquired of them, where is this Christ child to be born? This is Herod wants to know, like what's going on here? And he says to this, and they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, O you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. 
For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Can you picture this moment? Take yourself back again, 2,000 years ago. These, these, this band of magi, wise men traveling from the east over to Jerusalem. They show up in Jerusalem and they're like, hey, where is this king of the Jews? And the response they get is, oh no, what are you saying? Herod is like, king of the Jews? I am the king of the Jews. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. And everybody in Jerusalem is like, king of the Jews? Uh, we weren't, we, what, how, how do we know? What are you talking about? They're not excited about it. In fact, they're troubled. They're concerned. Like, what are you saying? Picture this moment, this place. Yeah. Put yourself in the shoes of the Magi. They're like, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that out loud because they're shocked. They, they, they're wondering why everybody is not excited about this incredible news. We have to ask ourselves the question, what happened? What, what was the moment that we were concerned about? I mean, what, why, were, why were the Jewish people not thrilled at the news? Why were they troubled? I mean, we can kind of get the idea of why Herod is troubled, right? I mean, he's the king and, and he does, certainly doesn't want to be replaced. And so in his mind, he's like, time out, time out, king of the Jews, I got to hear about this. We know that, right? We know Herod is like that. What you didn't maybe know about Herod was this. Herod was one of these guys that was what we call a control freak. For all of you who are control freaks in the room, this is Herod. What do I mean by that? Well, it was fascinating being in Israel last week and being able to see what Herod has done. He was a incredible builder, absolutely amazing. But one of the things he had a problem with was called his ego. When he was, uh, when he was gonna be put in power, he was actually on the opposite side. He, he was part of a rebellion on the other side and had to coerce himself into being king again. And he, he won that, but when he, in the midst of that, he found out that his wife was plotting against him and his wife ended up being killed because he's like, I don't want a wife who would be plotting against me. He kills his wife. Can you? Now, I don't know about you, but that's a little extreme. Men, yeah, let's not do that. But it's even worse than that because his two sons with that girl, that his wife, end up later plotting against him and he kills them as well. Yeah, you know, he knows how to handle things. Like I'm staying king. And then he kills another one of his sons. So we could kind of get the idea how, why Herod is troubled. And that's exactly why later on we'll find out that Herod doesn't get told where the Messiah is. And so what does he do? He slaughters all of the children in Bethlehem because he knows how to stay king. He thinks he doesn't realize that God's got a different plan. But I want to talk a little bit about these Jews. I mean, what in the world were the Jews up to? Why did they feel this way? I mean, we can understand, right? We can understand Herod's position, but can we understand the Jews? I mean, the Jews were the religious leaders. They, they were the Christians. They were the ones that knew the prophecy. They knew Daniel's story. They knew about the 69 weeks. They knew that the Messiah was coming. They knew that it had to be around this time, obviously. And yet when they are asked the question, when, when somebody reveals it to them, they, they run the other direction. Why? Well, it was kind of interesting to find out while we were over there about this time frame. You see, at this time frame. Israel was kind of like Washington, D.C., or Jerusalem was kind of like Washington, D.C. We call that the swamp. The swamp, the place where they say or they act as though they're doing righteous things by leading us, but in reality, they're just so corrupt, it's disgusting. We're just sick of it. We just hear in the legislation that they're passing even recently, and we're like, are you kidding me? This is ridiculous, right? We, we find ourselves in back 2000 years ago, the same thing. But not only that, was it a swamp politically, but it was also a swamp religiously. There was such inner fighting amongst all the denominational ideas. 
There was this anti-religious group, the Zealots. There were the Pharisees. They were the community activists. You had the Essenes who were the quiet ones. They were the separatists. They were so, so pious they had to remove themselves. You had the Sadducees who were always compromising in their faith. And you have all these religions are twists in all kinds of faiths. It's kind of like First Baptist, Second Baptist, Third Baptist, Fourth Baptist, Independent Baptist, Side Baptist, Celibate, and the list goes on and on and on. Right? I mean, there was just total chaos at this time. But, but it really, it was really about the question that probably caused, gave them the most concern. And what was the statement? It was, where is he who was born king of the Jews? You see, the Jews' concern immediately became not politics, although politics played a part. But it also became, oh no, the Messiah could be present and we're not living like we should. We're not living out the scripture like we should have. We are not fearing God. We're not living in love. We're not taking care of one another. We are not following the law. Man, they started to realize, oh my goodness, if it really is the Messiah, I am not ready. It probably hit them right in the face. It's kind of like, we might want to ask ourselves this question. If the trumpet sounded right now, would you be ready to stand before God? Right now, this moment, he walks through the doors, says, I am here. Are you ready? And some of you are like, uh, some of you singles are saying, well, I really kind of wanted to get married. And some of you guys in the middle of your life said, I thought I was going to have a little more time. Oh, what would it be? What would you be thinking? Where are you at? So before you judge these guys, think of it through that lens, okay? As we start talking about it today. Think about it through the lens of, I know these people should have been ready. They had all the signs. For crying out loud, there was a star in the sky. And yet they were still not ready And my question to you is, are you any different today? So what about that? Let's talk about us today. What does it look like? You know, we know the story. We we know that most of us in this room probably today claim to be believers. We're in our minds thinking, hey, I've got it. I comprehend what's happening. But the question is, are you all in? The reason why I love this topic is because you know that we've just finished an incredible year on what it means to be salt and light, a city on a hill. We spent the entire year doing this for one reason, to challenge you to change the way you think about yourself and your life. And it culminates into this last series, All In. All In. You see, the wise men were all in. They were all in. They were fully committed. You see, they didn't think like this. They, their lives reflected that they were living out what they believed. They were preparing their hearts for what they believed. They were excited about what God was doing in their lives. And I'm afraid today many believers may not be as excited as God would have them to be because they're really not all in. They're a fan, they're not a player. They're watching from the outside cheering, but they're not on the field playing. And so we become the religious unprepared. The religious unprepared. That's my question for you today. Are you the religious unprepared? You see, Jesus, as he grows up in his ministry, he starts to talk about the ideas that the wise men displayed at his birth, and he talks to us in that same fashion. And so we're gonna kind of compare the two. See, Jesus, when he was here, he, he started to give parables and tell stories, and he even shared a little bit about the end times and what it's gonna be like, and how we, you and I, should be acting, how we should be participating, how we should be like the wise men that are aware of what's happening and show up to the party ready to go and not be shocked that everybody else is not. So if you have your Bible, let's look at what Jesus said. Luke 
records it. We're going to look at Luke and Matthew, but Luke records it in Luke chapter 12 and verse 35. He uses this illustration about a wedding feast. The, the, the illustration is about us being ready for the return of the king, the return of the bridegroom, and how we as believers should be responding. And, and this is really important because, again, this story, we read it every Christmas, we know the Christmas story, and yet we never seem to evaluate our own lives in comparison. And that's what we're going to do today. Jesus speaking says this in verse 35, Luke chapter 12, verse 35, it says this, Stay dressed for action. He has just got done talking about his second coming. And he says, listen to me, you need to make sure that you stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at his table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants, man. Blessed are we when we are ready to go. Hmm. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour a thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect. I'm afraid in American church today, probably over the last 30 or 40 years, I would probably say since Israel has become a nation, the church has gotten complacent because they've been focusing on the fact that the prophecy says that Christ will return in one generation after Israel becomes a nation. And so what do Christians do? They do everything in their power, maybe to share the gospel or they're into church growth or they're, they're all talking about the return of Christ, but they're not necessarily all about what God would have them to do. And that is to be salt and light through the entire event. Busy working until the moment Christ comes. You see, I believe that being all in requires us to have a purpose, a meaning in life, and it requires this one word, these two words, to be passionate and prepared. To be passionate and prepared. When I think of the wise men, I think of passionate men who were prepared. Passionate and prepared. Listen, Jesus warns us to be dressed for action in verse 35 and have your lamps burning. Have your lamps burning. Be ready. Be dressed for action. I don't know about you, but when I, am, uh, when I uh, have to get up early in the morning, I have a tendency to have my clothes like right next to the bed. Actually, and sometimes when I'm commercial fishing, I just sleep in my clothes. I don't know about you, but I am so lazy. I don't want to take a ton of time getting ready early. Like I want to sleep up in the last minute. But when I get up, clothes are on, I'm ready to go. This is what it means when Christ is saying, listen, I need the church to be dressed and ready. So church, ask yourself the question, are you dressed and ready for Christ's return today? Right this moment, right at this time. Are you prepared? Are you all in? You see, again, we've been talking about salt and light, the city on a hill, knowing our identity and loving our identity. We've been talking about what it means to be all in and be fully committed, but now we want to ask ourselves, passionate and are prepared. Have you ever met a passionate person? Again, take yourself back to that fan, that crazy guy, that crazy girl. I mean, I can see him now. They got, you know, OSU on their chests, acting like fools but they are ready and excited. Are we that excited about Jesus? You know, are, are we really, really, really excited about Jesus and who he is? Luke kind of clarifies, I'm sorry, Matthew kind of clarifies this idea of being prepared in his telling of the story of the virgins. So if you have your Bible, flip over really quick to Matthew chapter 25. So, so Matthew is going to share a little different perspective on this. 
He says this in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 1, referring to this idea of being prepared. What it means to be passionate and prepared. He says this, when the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Verse 2 says this, five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. For the foolish took their lamps and they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. And as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. Now I want you to think about that word delayed. Is that not what we've been hearing forever? I can tell you I've been hearing that forever. Christ is coming back tomorrow. What happens? Christ is coming back tomorrow. Man, we have more people tell us when Christ is coming back, even though the Bible says nobody knows the day or the hour. They don't care. They continue to tell us Christ is coming back and they give us some crazy date. And guess what? He doesn't come back on the day. See, Christ can come back whenever he wants, by the way. He's kind of in charge. But our job is to be ready for the return, not anticipating and calling out the return date because he has a tendency to delay or be on his time frame and not ours. But then it says this in verse six, but at the midnight cry, here's the bridegroom, come out and meet him. What happens? Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered saying, since there will not be enough for us, hmm, go rather to the dealers and buy yourselves your own oil. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. And afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. This is a pretty harsh statement. Watch therefore, for you not know, know not neither the day nor the hour. Five wise, five foolish. What does it mean to be passionate and prepared? It means that you're waiting and you're ready. You're busy about the Lord's work in eager anticipation for his return. And I'm afraid that we have lost some of that enthusiasm and that excitement that we pass from generation to generation. The question is this, is our lamp going out? Was it ever lit? How did it lose? How, how, how did it lose its light? What's happening? See, the wise were both passionate and prepared. They, dressed and re they were dressed and ready. They did not get caught off guard. They were prepared. They had extra oil. Now listen, a lot of times I see this happening. As a youth pastor for many, many years, I would see this happen in the youth and maybe you can identify. You go somewhere where Christ is present and you can feel his presence, let's say it's camp. And you go for a week to camp, you rededicate your life to Christ, you are so on fire, you are so excited about what God has to do, and then you go home. And you face the church who's not quite as excited as you. As a matter of fact, all the adults act like, well, that'll, run, that'll wear off. Before you know it, you find yourself worse off than you were when you went to camp. And you realize what in the world has happened? How did I lose my enthusiasm about what Christ is doing in my life? So I, I'm gonna ask you that question. What's happened to you? What's happened to me? What's happened to us? Why are we not fully engaged and as excited as we've ever been? It's not like we should be excited and then plateau. No, we should continue to be more and more and more and more excited about who Christ is in our lives and how he plays a part. We shouldn't find less and less ways to get involved. We should be finding more and more ways to get involved in what God would use us for by using our gifts for his glory. I'm afraid what's happened is we had a camp experience oftentimes that lasts a month or a week or a year, but rarely do we find believers who are all in for a lifetime, fully committed followers of Christ. Now, I know there's many of you in the room that are that way. I'm so excited for you. I'm so glad that you are passionate or more passionate about Christ today than you ever were when you were younger. But as a whole, as the most part of the world today, that's not actually what's happening. We're being distracted, we're being 
torn apart. We're being like those who weren't ready when the wise men showed up to make the pronouncement. They didn't even see the star. They weren't aware what was happening. They forgot Daniel's prophecies. You see, they were missing the entire point. I feel like oftentimes that's what our church, churches find themselves doing, distracted. How do I know this? Well, Revelation kind of gives us a little re reveal of seven churches. One of them is a very interesting church to me. Revelation chapter two and verse three says this about a church. Strives this church as saying this, I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. I think of many churches that say, listen, we are in the grind, man. We are doing the work. We are, we are all in. In our minds, we are all in because we equate all in, listen, to what we do. We equate all in to the works that we are doing and there's nothing wrong with that on the surface. But then he makes this statement in verse four because he wants to clarify what it means to be all in. It's not just the works that you do. He says this, but I have this against you, you that you have abandoned or you have lost the love you had at first. Now, I'm afraid that one of the reasons why Christians are not as excited about Christ's return as they once were is they're busy doing the work but they're not doing the love. They're not doing it because they have an incredible growing love for God. They actually have a greater love for themselves in the work that they're doing for God and they're substituting a love for God for the work of what God is. And I hope you can understand that. The work is important, yes, but without the love, we find ourselves distracted. We, we miss the enthusiasm, the point leaves us. There will be times, listen to me, there will be times when it just doesn't feel like loving. There'll be times in your life where it just doesn't feel like God is there, he's present, he's around. But he wants you to understand something. He's looking for those who endure through these moments, who find themselves in love with him. When we are in love with him, we are looking to him, we are seeing what he sees and our hearts are in tune with him. Notice Galatians chapter six and verse nine. We know this verse. Let us not grow weary in well doing while doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And we quote that verse and we quote that verse and we quote that verse, but the truth is this. Without love, that verse has no power. Let me say that again. Without love, that verse has no power. You don't convince the next generation to get all in and get fully committed if you don't display that the reason why you do it is because you love God, not because you have a duty. It doesn't work like that. The next generation is looking for the passion you have, the love that you have for the brethren and for the father. And that's what the world will see that makes us different than them. And this is exactly what the wise men possessed. We must not only fight not to lose our passion, but we also must fight to live out our passion by being prepared. Being prepared. Being prepared requires us to understand God is God and we are not. He may delay, but we remain faithful. We, he allows us to have trials, but again, we remain faithful. Life may be unfair, but we remain faithful. Being prepared is strengthening our faith in the good times to endure through the tough times. Being prepared understands that it is a passion for our faith for the next generation, not just our own selfish desires. We have to think this way. The wise men were passionate, they were prepared, but also this, they were awake and they were aware. They were passionate and prepared and they were awake and they were aware. Notice Luke chapter 12, verse 37, it says, blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say unto you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at his table. Awake and aware, are you awake and aware? Would you have missed the star is the ultimate question. Now consider the wise men. This is a fascinating story. 
I just want you to know that this is not in the Bible. It doesn't spell this out, but I want you to understand something. Where did these wise men come from and what are they all about? Well, if you remember hundreds of years earlier, Daniel was taken away to Babylon, that is Persia. And he had been given visions by God about the second coming of Christ and the final coming, the first coming and the second coming of Christ. And he had shared that he was in charge of all the wise men of the East. And for 500 years, let me say that again, for 500 years, those wise men took what Daniel said seriously and they stayed aware for 500 years plus. That is shocking. In a foreign land, the Jews weren't looking. No, it took someone else that was looking because all the Jews, by the way, did not go back to Israel after they could. Some of them stayed in the East. Woo, that's crazy, 500 years, passing it from generation to generation. Now listen, remember, they don't know when he's coming back. I mean, we could say they might've knew the 69 weeks and it was gonna be 400 some odd years and it was gonna be somewhere around this, but, but, but remember this, that still required them to pass that enthusiasm from generation to generation to generation to generation to generation so that they were ready, so that they were ready. They had to make sure that they had the time. They had to make sure that they had the money, the gifts, the ability to come and worship. They had to be willing to go to a foreign land and face a king and tell the king, hey, we're looking for your replacement, by the way, and not fear death. These guys are all in. They're awake and they're aware for 500 years. I'm afraid modern day Christians can't stay excited till tomorrow. I mean, I can get up here, scream and dance and shout and yell and woo! You guys are like, yeah! And then tomorrow I'll be like, yeah. By Wednesday it's like, uh. 500 years. Over 500 years, this is what God was doing. These disciples, or the, sorry, these wise men were all in. They were passionate, prepared, awake, and ready. For us today, 2,000 years later, what does this mean? To be awake is to believe wholeheartedly in the second coming. Listen, my friend, if you're here today and you're a believer, I need you to understand your life is about Christ's return bringing glory to him to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, the ability for us to lay our, our offerings, our works at his feet and say, we loved you. We gave ourselves to you. This is our passion. This is our calling. This is our purpose to do everything we can to grow the family of God. It blows our minds. Being aware means that we are looking we are setting our minds on things above and not on things below. We are awake and aware that leads us to live an intentional Christian life. Living an intentional Christian life matters. Now, I'm afraid this is what happens to us. The reason why we're not awake and aware is because we're not living intentionally for Christ. When we wake up in the morning, we're not thinking and processing, man, if the Lord came back today, what do I need to be about doing? What do I need to be doing? How do I need to be loving? How do we, I need to be living? Paul says it this way. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, I love this passage. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. How shall we be changed? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be rise imperishable. And we shall be changed. For the perishable body must put on the imperishable, and the moral body must put on immortality. But when the perishable puts on the imper sorry, the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the moral puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, "Death is swallowed up in victory." O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord. Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, church. Be immovable, church. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not 
in vain. Not in vain, church. The reason why we are enthusiastic, awake, and aware, passionate, and prepared is because our work is not in vain. It's not an accident. It doesn't, it has eternal consequences, and this is what we do. So in closing, I want you to think about this. Today, I want you to be a part. I want to invite you in to something big, a big event, a time of enthusiasm and excitement, something that is life-changing, something that goes beyond time and space, something that is eternal, something that has worth for all of your efforts, something that is worthy of your sacrifice, something that you will never regret, something that is worth living passionately and prepared for, something that's worth living awake and aware of. His name, his name is Jesus. And if you've never given your life to him, if you're not passionately and preparing to face him face to face, that is my challenge to you today. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus, it's about this moment. The moment to say, listen, I am all in. I will be like the wise men. I will not be like the Jews who are fearful. No, I will be prepared. My heart will be prepared. I will be forgiven. I will be receiving the grace of God. And that requires us to confess that he is Lord and believe in our heart that he has risen from the dead. And if you've never done that here today, I promise you, you need to do that. That's where your peace lies in realizing that he's God and you're not and your job is to worship him and give your life to him. You'll be forgiven of every sin that you've ever committed and everyone you're ever going to commit. You're going to have grace that you have never experienced. You're going to have freedom that you've never known. And that is the love of Jesus. But church, listen, it doesn't end there. He doesn't end there. It's just the beginning. Now the job is for us to be steadfast, have our affairs in order, be intentional, be awake, be faithful. It's time for us to look, to live, and to lead. Look, live, and lead. It's time for us to be wise, like the wise men, like the wise versions, prepared for the returning of the king. Are you ready? If Christ came home today, came back today, the trumpet sounded, would you be ready? Let's stand with our heads bowed. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, in just a minute, we're gonna have prayer time. What does that mean? It means that every service we end with prayer because we know we cannot do this on our own will. It requires us to be led by the Spirit. And so we have prayer time. It's just a time for us to reflect on this message. Am I all in? Am I all in? Am I passionate and prepared? Am I awake and am I aware? Am I ready to be all that God has called me to be? Are you? During prayer time, I want you to be praying and asking that question. What would it look like if you and I lived all in? What would it look like? Would we have joined the caravan to Bethlehem or stayed in Jerusalem and plotted with Herod the king in opposition to our Messiah? Before you answer that, Ask yourself the question, am I prepared? Am I passionate? Am I awake? Am I aware? It's prayer time, church. If that's you today, I'd ask you to come and join me because I can promise you I'm not awake as I should be. I'm not as aware as I should be. I'm not passionate like I should be. I'm not as prepared as I should be. But God's grace, amen, is sufficient. Tomorrow's a new day. I can change the direction that I'm going, and so can you. Hey, everybody, Pastor Ron here. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Here at ABT, we make a big deal about following Jesus. 
Make sure that you subscribe and hit our notification bell so that you don't miss any of our upcoming video content. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry, please click donate now. Thanks for watching.